So please, Ikona, tell us all about your PhD project. Uh, okay. Okay, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, as introduced, can you guys hear me or am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay. So as introduced, my name is Akona Mioli, and today I'll be presenting some of the key findings of my master's project, which was titled Metabolomic Studies Involving Computational Tools to Investigate the Chemical Space and Biochemistry of Different Cannabis Cultivars. Throughout this journey, I was under the supervision of Dr. Fidel Tugizimana and under the co-supervision of Prof. Matala and Prof. Justin. The dissertation in its entirety was comprised of five chapters as shown. And the main aim of the study was to simply apply metabolomics approaches to characterize the chemistries and the underlying biochemistry of different cannabis cultivars that are used for medicinal purposes. To achieve this aim, the following objectives were followed. Firstly, a comprehensive literature survey and methodologies were compiled, and this was followed by the assessment of the metabolic landscape of the different cultivars using the LCMS-MS analysis workflow. And then based on objective number two, the third objective was to then perform structural elucidation of metabolite features that are potential novel compounds. And then lastly, in silico molecular docking studies were performed in order to predict the biological activities of selected metabolites. And this was done in conjunction with biological assay studies. Okay. So um, this project at its core, it was based on plant natural product research with the plant of interest being cannabis as indicated in the title of the study. Um, now, why cannabis? Well, cannabis is one of the plant genera that has gained attention for its bioactive natural products, as well as its use as a medicinal plant. This special plant comes from the family Cannabisiae, but that's as far as I'm willing to go when it comes to the botanical classification of this plant. Reason being is that there is a group of scientists who believe that cannabis is divided into three species in the form of sativa, indica, and ruderalis. And then there is another camp of scientists or group of scientists who believe that cannabis is actually divided into two species. So in the form of sativa and indica. So as you can see, uh, let me just get the laser pointer. Okay. So as you can see, there is a lot of confusion um, regarding this topic and actually a lot of debates concerning this topic. Uh, however, despite of the classific um, classification debates, the extensive use of cannabis dates back to 5,000 years ago, where it was used for recreational uses, medicinal uses, and textile uses. With regards to its medicinal uses, cannabis is known to alleviate symptoms within individuals that are suffering from cancer or individuals that are suffering from HIV. And it's also known to alleviate neurological symptoms such as your sleeping disorders. And all these observed therapeutic properties of this plant are largely attributed to a class of compounds called cannabinoids. And in particular, compounds such as your CBD and THC. And evidently enough, numerous medications have been developed from these compounds, examples being your THC-based nabulone, which is used to treat pain, as well as the CBD-based epidiolex, which is used to treat seizures. So given these examples, one can see that past research and some of the current research that are ongoing today mainly focus on cannabinoids. However, the phytochemistry or the metabolome of cannabis is not fully understood yet, nor has it been fully explored. 
And when considering cannabis as a medicinal plant, it is very important to note that there are other chemical classes within this plant beyond cannabinoids. And therefore, the chemical exploration of cannabis remains paramount because the information that can be generated from these studies can give us insight to better understand the biological properties of this plant and can also lead to the discovery of novel compounds. So keeping that in mind, metabolomics has been suggested for the chemical exploration of cannabis, and such an exploration has been coined the term cannabolomics, and cannabolomics has the ultimate goal of revealing new drug candidates within this plant. So some of you might be asking yourselves, well, why metabolomics amongst the other omic sciences? And the answer to that is that metabolomics offers us one of the biggest advantages in the sense that the use of its 4IR analytical and computational tools reveals the downstream information of gene expression and protein expression, meaning that the measured metabolites can be linked back to upstream information. And in the realm, of natural product research that then um, opens up a new array of opportunities and possibilities. So in this project, we took full advantage of those metabolomics computational tools in the form of feature-based molecular networking and MS2LDA. Feature-based molecular networking is a computational tool that works on the basis that compounds that are similar in their structure will fragment to produce similar fragmentation patterns. And then based on those fragmentation patterns, the compounds are then grouped into molecular families. Additionally, this computational tool also enables the automated annotation of metabolites. But most importantly, feature-based molecular networking also enables the visualization of the chemical space that one would be working with in that moment, whether it is a crude extract or a special sample. And then another tool that we took advantage of was MS2LDA. And MS2LDA is an unsupervised substructure discovery tool. And how it works is that it annotates the building blocks or the substructures of the compound. And by doing this, it then propagates the identity of that compound. So both feature-based molecular networking and MS2LDA, in addition to other molecular networking tools, are all housed in a web-based ecosystem called GNPS. Now to further anchor or emphasize the advantages of using these tools in the context of natural product research is that these tools actually help in addressing one of the biggest challenges in natural product research, which is the lack of dereplication of compounds, which often leads to the re-isolation of known chemical entities instead of leading to new um, novel compounds. So for an example, in metabolomics terms, when one is working with the crude extract, about 98% of the spectra that is produced from the crude extract is known as dark matter. And when we try to annotate um, the spectra using the conventional methods, we are only able to annotate about 2% of the spectra. However, when we use these computational tools, we are now able to annotate more than the 2%, meaning that we tap into the dark matter and we illuminate the dark matter. And by virtue of doing this, we therefore enhance the dereplication of compounds, which is quite a positive, uh, a positive step within natural product research, which then brings me to the results of my study. So in this study, we studied two cannabis cultivars um, in the form of the leaves and flowers of amnesia haze and the leaves and flowers of royal Dutch cheese. So the chemometric models that were produced from the LCMS data that we acquired showed cultivar to cultivar metabolite differences as well as plant tissue to plant tissue metabolite differences. So what this means is that the two cultivars that we're working with were chemically different from each other and that the chemical differences were attributed to the metabolite profiles of the leaves and the metabolite profiles of the flowers. 
So to better understand these metabolite differences, we then had to perform metabolite annotation. And as mentioned, we made full use of um, the computational tools, such as your feature-based molecular networking. So from feature-based molecular networking, we were able to identify the cannabinoid cluster in these cultivars. So we're able to identify this cluster because one of the metabolites were automatically annotated through GNPS spectral library matching as being CBD. And this then propagated the identity of other cannabinoids within this cluster, examples being your CBDA and your CBDVA. And in the same breath, we were also able to identify flavonoids. So this cluster was a flavonoid cluster because some of the compounds in this cluster were automatically annotated as being your luteolin, as well as your vitexin 2 or remnicide. So this were, these were annotated through the GNPS spectral library matching. And this then also propagated the identity of other flavonoids, such as your canaflavin B, which is actually one of the unique uh, flavonoids that are found in cannabis. So overall, we were able to use these computational tools to uh, perform the dereplication of compounds and to also identify the different clusters that are present within these cultivars. In addition to this, um, the use of molecular networking or feature-based molecular networking also collaborated with the chemometric models that we saw earlier on. So the networks that were generated also showed us the cultivar to cultivar metabolite differences, as well as the plant tissue to plant tissue metabolite differences. So for instance, if we look at the profiles of the leaves and the flowers, we saw that um, the leaves and the flowers shared common chemical classes between them. However, the distribution of these uh, chemical classes differed from plant tissue to plant tissue and from cultivar to cultivar. So when we look at the cannabinoid content, we saw that the leaves of these cultivars were producing cannabinoids at lower levels compared to the flowers. And when looking at the flavonoid content, we also saw that the leaves were producing more uh, levels of flavonoid com flavonoids compared to the flowers. So essentially, we were able to use these metabolite differences in order to differentiate or classify the two cultivars into chemovars. And the next question would be then, what is the significance of these metabolite differences or what is the significance of chemovar information and how can we apply that in the real world? Well, one, way of applying this scheme of our information in the real world is that this type of information can help us um, identify specific cannabis plants for specific medicinal uh, applications. So what do I mean by that? So again, when zooming into the cannabinoid content, we saw that the leaves of the cultivars were producing more of your non-active cannabinoids or acidic cannabinoids. However, the flowers were producing more of your active cannabinoids such as your CBD and CBN. So if an individual was looking for the biological activities of cannabinoids or the biological activities, for instance, of CBD, which is known to have anti-inflammatory properties, then they are better off using the flowers of these cultivars instead of the leaves, because we can see that, for instance, CBD was being produced in higher levels in the flowers, but more so in the flowers of Royal Dutch cheese compared to Amnesia haze. And then when looking at the flavonoid content, as mentioned earlier on, the leaves of these cultivars were producing more of the flavonoids compared to the flowers. So yet again, if an individual is looking for your flavonoid biological activities, such as your antioxidant activities, then they are better off using the leaves of these cultivars instead of the flowers. So now given the chemical profiles that we were able to elucidate 
from these um, cultivars. We then went on further to perform in silico molecular docking studies using a selected list of uh, metabolites that we were able to identify within these cultivars. And we did the study in order to predict whether these cultivars had any anti-cancer activities. So we took that selected list and we docked them against their cancer targets. And from this study, we saw that the cannabinoids had the highest or most significant uh, biological or binding affinities to their uh, cancer targets. For instance, when you look at THC, when THC was bound to its cancer target, which is a CB2, it had a very significant binding affinity of minus 10.3. And this was also followed by other compounds or other classes of compounds, such as your flavonoids, again. So when canaflavin A was bound to its receptor, which is caspase 3, it also had a significant binding affinity of minus 9.3. So overall, these in silico, um, studies or in silico results um, alluded to the notion that um, these two cultivars might have anti-cancer activities based on their overall chemical profiles. And to further support this study, we then went on further to perform biological assay studies uh, in order to test the cytotoxicity of these cultivars on normal cells and on cancerous cells. So for this study, we chose to continue with the flowers of the cultivars because number one, um, individuals that take cannabis as a medicinal plant, they preferably take the flowers over the leaves. And also most of the clinical research that is out there is based on the flowers instead of the leaves. So from this study, uh, we tested the, the flower extract of amnesia haze on the normal HEC293 cells, and we also tested it against the cancerous cells, which was your PACA2 cells. So on the normal cells, we saw that uh, amnesia haze did not cause any significant harm on the normal cells because on average, cellular viability was quite high. However, when it was introduced to, to the cancerous cells, we saw that on average, there was a decrease and cellular viability, meaning that there was some form of cell death that was occurring within these cancerous cells. And then when looking at um, the effect of royal Dutch cheese, we saw also that on the normal cells, on average, there was no significant harm that was caused by this flower extract. Uh, however, at a concentration of 100 microgram per mil, this uh, flower extract was quite so, uh, cytotoxic to the normal cells. So from this point, we knew that at higher concentrations, this extract is actually a no-go area. And then when looking at the effect of royal Dutch cheese on the cancerous cells, we saw that on average, it did cause a decrease in cellular viability, and therefore it was also causing some form of cell death. So with these Alama Blue uh, assay studies, we saw that both these cultivars uh, were causing cell death on the cancerous cells. And to further support this, we went on further to perform um, caspase activity to determine the caspase activity of the, of the cancerous cells uh, when they were treated with these two uh, flower extracts. And from this study, we also saw that both um, the flowers of royal Dutch cheese and amnesia haze had high caspase activity. However, royal Dutch cheese had the highest caspase activity compared to amnesia haze. And we know that a high caspase activity is linked to cell death that is caused by apoptotic events uh, or necroptotic events or even autophagic events. So for this reason, we then decided uh, on the fact that this is actually one of the cannabis strains or rather one of the cannabis chemovars because now we've um, uh, uh, described the chemical content of this uh, cannabis strain. So it's one of the chemovars that we would like to continue with for further studies which brings me to the significance of this study. So the significance of this study is that we were able to utilize metabolomics or cannabolomics in this instant to classify the cultivars into chemovars. And also from the cannabolomics work that was done here, um, the chemical profiles that we were able to elucidate 
also gave us insight to the, 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 the potential medicinal properties of this plant. And also the work that has been done here contributes to cannabis research and development, which is currently on the rise. And one way in which we plan to contribute to this movement is through publications. So these are the publications that are currently um, under preparation and also under review. And hopefully we can get them out by the end of the year. Uh, this brings me to the end of my presentation. These are my references. And these are my acknowledgements. I uh, couldn't have done it without all these people. So I'm very grateful for them. And yeah, so as introduced, I'm also a, a PhD student now, and I'm currently trying to figure out my study design, writing up a proposal and so forth. But I'm also open to um, collaborations and I'm also open to suggestions as to where I can take this work going further. So as you can see from the pictures, I'm very optimistic and very excited. Hopefully it stays the same until the end. So yeah, that's me. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. That was an awesome presentation. And I love the Thank term you. cannabinomics. Are, are you guys coining that term or has that been used before? Uh, it's been used before, but it's uh. new. Yeah, okay. The new kid in the block. Yeah. <laughs> very good presentation, a very interesting master study. So thank you. Anyone in the audience, if you would like to ask a question to our speaker, you are welcome to raise your hand and or um, write a question in the chat box. So I'm sure there must be some questions in this presentation because cannabinomics is a big topic at the moment um you're finding lots of new interesting things with cannabis plants and i know yeah for a fact that the 2018 was the first time the fda actually approved of the the epidiolex for, for seizure medication so it's still a very recent um drug in the essence but it's so old and so much mystery around it. I like the fact you guys use the term black uh, um, dark matter. So you guys are investigating dark matter in this interesting research. Yes, we try. <laughs> so there is a question in the chat box. Um, mm -hmm. I might have missed it, but which species specifically did you use? Um, you mentioned their morphological differences. Yes, so for this specific study, right? Um, so for this study, um, I was studying two strains. So the strains are, uh, the names are not species, uh, species based, but uh, with amnesia haze, it was 80% sativa and 20% uh, indica. And then with the Royal Dutch cheese, it was 60% sativa and 40% indica. So both of them were sort of like uh, sativa dominant, yeah, in a sense. Because it's very hard to get like a strain that is specifically just sativa overall because of the inbreeding that has been happening throughout the years. Another question. I answer. Yeah, I think think that answers that question. There's another one. And yeah, so well done, very cool study. I want to know what are the prerequisites for those analyses you use to get the dark matter of the metabolomics data? Is it limited to certain high resolution spectral analysis techniques? So how did you analyze the dark matter? Oh, um, for instance, using uh, feature-based molecular networking, as I mentioned, so you produce your spectra, right? And now you are also able to see the known and unknown. So the dark matter um, basically specifies all the unknown metabolites. So I think the computational tools that we used uh, sort of highlighted that dark matter. We can now visualize it and we can see uh, the dark matter being connected to the known metabolites that we know. So it just 
offers and that framework. An analytical instrument to get that, 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 that data. What did you use for that? Uh, LCMS, yeah, I used LCMS. Is there a specific type of LCMS that you used? Um, we use the LCMS um, that Dr. Madala has at Univen. So I think it was the Shimatsu um, LCMS. I'm, not, I'm just not sure about the model. I see Prof. Madala's in the audience. Do you have um, additional information there, Prof. Madala? Oh, there he is. He put it into the chat. It is a QTOF 9030 model. There we go. He is the man who knows all the technical aspects there. <laughs> yes. I see your supervisor, Fidel, is also in the audience. Do you have any questions for your student, Fidel? No. Or comments? <laughs> No, well done, uh, Akona. Thank uh, you. No, no question for her. Ah, so I job well is, done. Uh, a, lo a, a lot she has done, and maybe she didn't manage to capture everything in one presentation. Uh, also, they used the question regarding the dark matter. How do we tap into it? Uh, dark matter understood as uh, the, the spectra that we we cannot uh, put a name on or difficult to annotate. So the computational tools helps us to, to be able to get a sense or uh, uh, eliminate that dark matter. So one of the things that she did in her study was uh, what we termed as a chemical baiting, where you run the samples with a standard and as you saw, she explained the molecular networking philosophy or the rationale based on the structural similarities with uh, similar fragmentation that get computationally put together. So if you are able to annotate a single spectra or a single node, uh, you, it, that gives you really a great uh, step ahead or advantage to of an idea in terms of structurally of the chemical compounds that you have in that specific cluster. So if you have then a standard that you have run uh, of a specific class of compound of interest, uh, that uh, together with the unknown from your samples, it will help to cluster those different compounds and you get a, a better advantage to even annotate more uh, metabolites in, as you annotation improves, so you enhance your annotation using this computational tool, you really start getting to tap into the unknown, your dark matter or unknown unknown. So yes, there is quite a lot that one can do with these computational uh, frameworks that are imaging. And she has really tried her best and she's going to do more. <laughs> yes, she's a very ambitious student going into a PhD. So I kind of encourage you to, to give your email address there as well. So if anyone wants to contact you, uh, thank you for Del for, for those comments. So if anyone thank wants to so contact you. Akona, you could just put Should it I in type the, it in the comments? In the, in the chat box, yes. Because you mentioned anyone who has ideas for collaborations or contributions yes. to these projects, I'm sure Akona or her supervisors will welcome any contacts that anyone has or any questions that follow after this um, journal club. So we encourage communications with our speakers, with the audience. Don't, don't be scared. You can contact them. We're all friendly, yeah? Look at, look at Akona. She's, look how friendly she is. <laughs> <laughs> so don't be scared please send emails to her and she she seems to be very enthusiastic about her topic and a phd so definitely get in contact with her are there any other questions from our audience
So if not, I'm just going to then thank our speaker, Akona. Thank you so much. It was a great presentation and very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so there's one more question, but I had to join the mailing. I'll, 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 I'll add you to the mailing list. Just, anyone who wants to join the mailing list. Um, so there was a question, how do I join the mailing list for the Metabolomics of Africa? You can email me your um, request to join the mailing list. So in each um, advert that goes out for the Journal Club, there is an email there for nmr.nwu at gmail.com or um, Metabolomics of Africa's email there. You can request to be joined, to join the mailing list for all future talks. Okay, so thank you, Aikona, and I hope to see everyone again next week. Okay. Go well. Thank you.